All right, so um, this is a creative guy's PowerPoint, so it's, that means it's formatted not creatively. Have you ever noticed the more creative someone's supposed to be, the less creative the PowerPoint looks? So, um, and it's only the third PowerPoint I've ever made. I really never, never embraced the medium. But uh, I, I did have to embed a bunch of videos, and I want to make a couple key points. Um, not a lot, so I, I think it'll be a useful way to go. We are... Um, we're in the storytelling business, as I think a lot of people say now. It's become kind of a meme, you know, people are talking about it. And yet, I find that most people in our business really don't understand storytelling. We've become so um, obsessed with messaging, you know, from our clients and rational things that um, we, we, really don't, we really don't get it. I, I find it amazing because um, th that's really where this presentation came from. I, um, found that even the creatives at our place really, you know, had trouble telling a good story, had trouble turning brands into stories, and um, account people certainly weren't there at all. And um, as I said, I think we spend too much time on messaging and rational stuff in audiences, and we forget about the basic elements of storytelling. So I decided to make a presentation for my agency and really try and force people to kind of discover the story of our brands and to look at our customers as narrators and, and to kind of tilt the wheel a little bit. So, um, so if I said complete this sentence to all of you, and I, I've done this exercise with different groups, I've, I've taught this to a couple people, and I've actually made them do it, and I'm, I'm not gonna do that today because I wanna get through this so you can get back before you crash, um, or you might crash anyways. But um, if I asked you to do this, and if I asked a kindergarten class to do this, the same exact thing would happen. I, I can predict it with absolute certainty. In the first sentence, a hero would be introduced, most likely. If not a hero, at least a situation or a place. And that hero or character would run into some sort of trouble. Some, something would, there'd be a problem to solve, a challenge, an obstacle, something would happen. And he or she would have to figure out a way through it. And then there would be some sort of order restored at the end. That's about 90% of everybody, kindergartens and everybody else. Those are the plots, th those are the, um, uh, the main elements of storytelling, and they're natural to us. This is, there's a reason this is such a, you know, common, cliched sort of approach, because, the, you know, the elements are situation, character, conflict, suspense, and resolution, and that goes for, for everything we do. Um, why do we tell stories? Well, every culture tells stories in every part of the world, and, you know, Young and Campbell have studied the fact that we tell the same stories. These plots that I'm gonna talk through are absolutely universal, you know, and it's weird that, you know, pygmies that, you know, have a different language and have never seen technology have the same stories embedded into their culture that we have in our internet age culture. It's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I, I can't believe it. The first tablets ever found um, were from 5000 BC in a cave and they were a story, the story of Gilgamesh. And strangely enough, that story, if you look at the plot of that story, it's essentially the plot of Dr. No from James Bond and the plot of almost every sci-fi movie. There is a, um, the world is threatened by a dark villain who lives in an underground place or a remote island or you fill in the blank and um, he's threatening and a hero has to arise to combat him and that hero has to prepare himself for battle and um, there comes a point where the hero is out manned and is facing certain death and has an escape and order is restored. That's the plot of the first story ever uncovered 5,000 years ago and it's the plot of almost every other story. The Bible, stories. Imagine the Bible as a PowerPoint. The Bible as a series of lectures. It would have never caught on. It would have sold eight copies, you know. Um, the Greek myths, stories. Um, again, Joseph Campbell and uh, Young found archetypal stories that um, are repeated over and over again everywhere. Evolutionary psychologists think that storytelling is just hardwired into us, that, for example, if, if we have to remember which mushrooms to eat and which not to eat, it's better to have a story than a chart. Eventually you get to the chart, but stories are how we passed on information that we needed to actually um, adapt and survive. Um, lectures don't do it. If you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, stories are, are good. They actually impart things that we need to know. We also have what neurologists will tell you is imaginative, um, a visionary imagination. We actually see pictures when people talk. 
when we're read to, we actually form movies in our head. We do that naturally. That didn't just happen lately. That, that goes way back. Um, other species don't do that, and that's one of the reasons we're able to determine patterns. We're very pattern-oriented, and all these stories are based on really the same patterns. So um, technology, never going to kill storytelling. So I'm going to show you some really cool campaigns that are being done right now that are based on storytelling in a lot of ways. Um, technology actually will allow us to partner with people and tell stories with them um, through social media, through digital, through other things that we do if we use it right. Nobody wants to be lectured to, and that's uh, one of the things you have to tell your clients you know, since the beginning of time. You just have to keep telling them and, and keep telling them. So at one point, I, I did a bunch of searches, and I found the absolute authority says there are 13 plots. And you can find another authority on Google and on Google search that says there are 21 plots. I've heard five, I've heard three, I've heard seven, I've heard 21. So this is called a prop. I didn't actually read this whole thing, OK? Um, but it's here for credibility's sake. Apparently, this guy, Joseph, um, Joseph uh, Christopher Booker, got a little tired of figuring out, you know, is it seven, is it 13, is it 21? And he spent about 30 years, he's an English professor, actually studying world literature. And he, this book came out recently, and he has determined that there are seven basic plots. So I, I believe him. Um, I read enough of the book to get an idea of what he's talking about. Um, and it, it's amazing. He points out Bonnie and Clyde is the story of Macbeth. And Cinderella is the story of trading places. And uh, the Odyssey and the Hangover, same plot. It's amazing. Um, he identified seven. I'm going to focus on five because two of his seven um, are comedy and tragedy. And they don't really apply to advertising very much. Um, tragedy is something we're not big on um, you know, for our clients. Uh, and comedy is basically what we insert into every plot pretty much anyway. So, and, and those are very, quite variable. If you actually read what he says, the characteristics that make up comedy and tragedy are all over the map a little bit. So I kick, I kick those out. There's five. The point of this really isn't, this is what I told the folks at my place, the point of this is not to say, I'm doing a rebirth story for one of my clients, or, you know, um, it's just to get the idea that there's stories everywhere. And I'm going to show you examples from our work that are based on storytelling and from some work out in the industry. So um, we're going to focus on overcoming the monster, which is a very classic one, rags to riches, the quest, voyage and return, and rebirth. Okay, and you'll see how familiar these are. I have some fun uh, classic things to show you. Uh, let's go to the first one. Overcoming the monster. So um, this is every science fiction movie ever made. It's every World War II film ever made. Um, the German machine overcoming that monster. The monster can be an idea. The monster does not have to be physical in any way. Um, the world is basically threatened by this deformed character, deformed in some way. Could even be super intelligent. Um, lives somewhere you know, distant but is kind of invading, and our hero has to prepare for the journey and sort of uh, fix things and set things right. I'm just going to show you some popular culture stuff that's absolutely overcoming the monster. I think example is a good way to kind of get it. The Bible also uses this. You know, David and Goliath is a classic overcoming the monster story, and um, Jack and the Beanstalk, so fairy tale, Greek myth. It's, it's just it's all over the place. Um, Basically, these are the elements, and, and you'll notice these elements are very similar in all five plots. They start to blur, so I go through it a little bit, and then I just kind of rush through it. But, um, you know, the situation is usually set. In, in these kinds of stories, the situation is tranquil with one threatening little dark cloud. It's just foreshadowed very little bit in the beginning, and then um, it's, it starts, you start to hear more about it. And so for the first fourth of the story, you start to build that there's trouble brewing. At that point, the hero has to prepare himself or herself um, and then has to set forth. This is what clients don't get. The more obstacles, the better a story. So this is why corporate stories, our clients always say, you know, we're doing a corporate story. It, it's absolute nonsense. It's not a story. It's a whitewashed sort of the world is perfect and we figured out this solution, if they even get the problem and solution. So I'm constantly bitching at my clients, put the troubles in. The more you overcame, the more everyone likes the story. I'm going to show you some hospital advertising we've done for Akron Children's where we literally show the obstacles. We show kids that were on the brink of death and we actually talk about that, you know, while you watch them. I, I'll show you some of those. We, we've done them for years, but um, based on stories. The more obstacles in the way, the better the escape. 
And nightmare is, is a way to say it really gets dark. There's a point in these stories where, you know, the guy's done for. You know, Batman, always tied up by, uh, you know, the Joker, but always escaped. That wasn't so dramatic. But um, anyways, let me, let me show you some examples from our business. Because you're probably saying, how, how do you actually build commercials, campaigns, brochures, videos from this? This is, this is a classic overcoming the monster. I'm just going to let it play. So, you know, you don't, you don't get all the elements, you, you don't get all five of those sort of plot elements when you translate the work into advertising a lot, but you get the idea that conformity is sort of the monster that's going to be overcome and, you know, the powers that be, which is kind of ironic. But um, what, what, I, what I would say, it's really important to help your brands pick an enemy. Even if you don't end up crafting really great stories, what you can take out of the overcoming the monster sort of structure is that it's, it's really great to have an enemy. And a lot of brands don't, don't think that way. Um, so for example, we, we were working on bottled water for Nestle Waters. And they were kind of the enemy of a lot of uh, environmentalists and they were taking a lot of um, abuse you know, for taking water that's a resource and then selling it to people. Also pollution because people don't recycle the bottles even though our client worked really hard to make the bottles out of more recycled material, blah, blah, blah. So, we said, well, you know, to tell our story, you've been telling the story for years before we got here and nobody was listening because it was all, we're really great. We're not the bad guys. We said, let's pick a bad guy. So we picked sugared beverages. And we did a campaign about three years ago that really focused on, you got the wrong guy. It's sugared beverages. They're making everybody fat and their bottles are thicker than our bottles. And it, it worked amazingly well. We, we moved the needle so much for these guys. So I would say that you should pick an enemy. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a competitor. Um, for Akron Children's Hospital, you know, the enemy could be cancer. The enemy could be childhood cancer. So it can be something that your audience needs to overcome. It could be something that your brand um, actually competes against. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, let me show you an Akron Children's, oh no, this is something different, okay. Um, th th this is kind of fun. Th this is very sci-fi and very, um, you can see very story telling but it was an event. It'll explain itself. I'll play it for you. This is some of our work. They're everywhere. You get bit, your whole foot swells up. Yeah, we have ants and they're vicious. My hand swells up. Yeah, you just cannot kill them. That's right. I heard that there's no bugs in Texas. No small ones. <laughs> I mean, you grow up in Texas, you learn to watch for ants and run. Each one of them has the power to hurt you. <laughs> Hero could be the product, you know. Clients like that part. Ants invade downtown Houston. Monstrous 3D ants took over the building across 
from Minute Maid Park last night. It was quite a sight for fans as they left the Astros Chicago Cubs game. But Mammoth Ants crawled in and out of the building one by one, then multiplied to cover the entire building. This was a big PR stunt for Black Flag Pest Control. I actually got interviewed by the um, Japanese version of the Wall Street Journal, I think it's called the Nikkei or something, and it, I thought that was so funny because we were talking about Japanese um, old school B-rated you know, science fiction movies as we developed this idea, so um, it was kind of cool. So um, those are just a couple examples, you can go on and on, but again, the takeaway to me is find an enemy, create obstacles, ha have some drama, and, and you get somewhere, and it just changes the whole equation. Um, Rags to Riches is another, um, uh, another plot. Cinderella is the classic. You know, you see this and you, you totally get the idea of Rags to Riches. Um, there's obviously a couple others. Trading Places, um, Oliver, My Fair Lady, Pretty Woman, those are all. Uh, and and there's, there's tons of this stuff out there. Um, and, and, you know, again, these start to get similar. But um, whereas things start pretty happy in the other one, and then the threatening clouds come. This starts in the dark, you know. Cinderella is abused. We open on her, and she is not, you know, having a good life. Um, uh, and then there's, there's a call. In this case, the call is um, to go to the ball, right? So there's some sort of, you know, you get picked and chosen in some way. There's some success. She was doing great at the ball. Got some rewards. Guys kind of liked her. Um, and then a crisis happens, midnight, the shoe. So this is really the best example to just kind of remember. But um, th think about... Here's another thing to think about. A lot of people have this story. A lot of entrepreneurs have this story. And entrepreneurs are tied very closely to their brand. So, you know, Howard Schultz has this story. Oprah has this story. Um, Sam Walton, you know. Challenger brands have this story. We worked for years with Tarquette Flooring and Johnsonite Flooring. And they were, when we met them, they were the wall base guys. Wall base is like the biggest crappy, un- cool shit ever, you know what I mean? And they wanted to be the flooring guys, so they would develop some lines of flooring. And we kind of took that chip on their shoulder and we just kept kind of pushing that chip and they were just the classic challenger brand. And they're now kind of a rags to riches story. They're one of the leaders in their category. It took about eight or nine years and having that story to tell. It, it animated them internally and it animated the work that we did for them. So again, it might not be a campaign, it might be a brand essence. It might be understanding your client and positioning them as a rags to riches kind of story. Um, but there's, there's lots of things. You know, we work for the Boys Club and Girls Club. Rags to riches stories, you know, and the riches are not huge riches. They're just escaping gang culture and actually graduating high school. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a huge thing. We don't do this for the lottery yet, but I, I'm encouraging people at our place to think about um, lottery stories as rag to riches stories and actually focus on people more than just the jackpot and the prize. We haven't really gotten there yet, and in my opinion, we're doing kind of traditional stuff, but I, I think there's a lot there. Um, uh, you know, a cool idea for the lottery might be to find um, somebody who set up a philanthropic fund and actually watch how that fund helps people. So there's layers of stories. You know, there, you can do rags to riches embedded in rags to riches. So there, there's, there's a lot of stuff you know. Let me show you a couple examples. Um, this one is not a great piece of creative work, but clearly playing off of this. Speramos meliora, resurgit quimeribus. We hope for better things. It will rise from the ashes. That's the motto of our fair city. And from that city comes a car with something to prove. A car with a refined suspension and one of the most elegant designs of any car in its class. This is the Motor City, and this is what we do. I mean, this campaign, you know, has a, a backstory and a context, which is that they all almost went out of business. And so it, it is a rise from the ashes, you know, a rags to riches story. They could have exploited some of it a little bit better, but it's just one that came to mind, and I, I wanted to just have an example here. So um, 
So there's that one. Let me, let me keep moving ahead because I have some longer cases that I want to show you. Um, the quest, you know, every Greek myth is a quest. Um, and now you start to notice some overlap. The quest often has a monster in it that you have to overcome. But, you know, they're a little, the quest stories are a little bit different. In the, in the overcoming the monster, you're just minding your own business and there's a dude doing some bad shit and you have to go fight it. In the quest, you actually have to get somewhere. You, you, have, you have your own motivated goal and you run into obstacles, often they're monsters, along the way. Um, Indiana Jones, classic quest story. Um, what is this one? Oh, the Ten Commandments. You know, it's kind of a, the Exodus is kind of literally a quest. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of them, you know. They're, they're all over the place. Moby Dick is the most boring book ever written in English. I was an English major, master's in English, taught English, worst book ever. Um, very overrated. Anyways, um, uh, so, so this one has an element that I find really interesting that the others don't, and it's, it's companions, sidekicks. Every Disney movie, great sidekicks. The sidekicks actually make the Disney work phenomenal, you know what I mean? So a lot of beer commercials have this bad sort of sidekick thing, the wingman, you know, all the stupid 19-year-old male commercials. So, um, but again, they're, they're using plots. I'm not saying they always get you to great places, but they get you somewhere. Um, so a lot of brands are on a quest, and just telling them they're on a quest makes a huge difference in how you work with them, you know? They have mission statements, and they have vision statements, and they have business goals. Well, people don't give a shit about that. If you have a quest, I can give a shit. Quest for a smarter planet, IBM, let's build a smarter planet. Absolute brilliant quest campaign. There's so many, I, I didn't even bring any of those in, but there's so many great things. They, every year they just take that and do better and better work. Um, Lexus, the relentless pursuit of perfection, they just said we're on a quest. And then they kept showing that's lasted 25 years. Um, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. This is actually a really easy one. Um, he, here's a spot we did for Akron Children's, I'll show you this, um, that, that actually is a personal quest. So again, what I said earlier was brands have quests, but they should also look at their customers and see if they can become personal narrators and if their quest can align with the brand's quest, you've got some powerful chemistry. So here's, um, here's something we did for Akron Children's. What's Catherine like? Catherine's like a Volkswagen engine and a NASCAR automobile. <laughs> Most people wouldn't even bother going to the racetrack. They said, I'm not going to race you. Your engine's faster than mine. But Catherine shows up every weekend for the race, not only ready to race, but with this attitude of, I think I'm going to win. It depends on the race, but yeah. <laughs> So we did a lot more work with her. We have all sorts of videos and backstories, but she's on a quest for normalcy. And the more obstacles we show, the better. At one point, the client said, wait a second, if she had all those heart surgeries, does that sound like we didn't get it right? You know, I mean, this is what clients do, you know? So we, we convinced them that, you know, no, I, I mean, you, you, you got her to where she is. Look how healthy she is. What, you know? So the more obstacles you mention, the better. I'm going to show you one where literally a girl was practically at death, and you just see her dancing. I'll show you that one in a minute. So, um, so, so again, you know, uh, it changes everything if you think of it as a story versus thinking of it as a message. Our message is we make kids better. It's not that exciting. Find a story that sort of illustrates that, and you get somewhere, I think. Um, Pepsi Refresh is a quest, you know. This is, a, this is an interesting campaign. It's being talked about a lot in marketing classes because it kind of succeeded and it kind of failed. Um, it's sort of interesting, but I'm just going to show you a quick reminder of it. Oh, maybe I'm not. Let me see. Okay. We have new porch now on the side of the house. We got the word out to our families and friends and co-workers. This is really a much bigger opportunity for us. It's 
So it's kind of a corporate quest, but it's not boring like a lot of corporate quests. And what I love about it is uh, it used social, it used digital, and it actually went out and got all these people who have miniature quests and funded those quests. So again, it's embedded within the bigger brand story are all our customer stories. Let's bring them to life. We all kind of get credit and we're on a mission, you know? So uh, this is an easy one. Every brand is on a mission. Um, so so uh, I'll tell you about one. I, I didn't bring the case because the case is like four minutes long and it's a little boring, but the work is, is really, really smart. One of our teams uh, did a project last summer for um, Krylon spray paints called 24 and 24. And basically the client came and said, we have these new spray paints and we put new nozzles on them and they're really awesome. You could do millions of things with them. Just tell everybody that. I mean, it was the worst briefing kind of ever. You know what I mean? You know, like people are really going to care about the angle of the sprayer. You know what I mean? So um, what we came up with and, and do it like with TV or something really stupid like that. So we took all the money. We said, don't do TV. And what our team said was, um, let's get somebody and challenge them to make 24 projects because the spray can is so great in 24 hours and let's film it all. So we actually created a live 24 hour TV program um, called 24 and 24. We hired Jeff Devlin from uh, HGTV. I can't remember what show he does. And he literally in real time with no fake prep did it. We webcasted. We, um, you could actually watch the live event from banner ads on DIY websites. We had people engaging for 40, 50 minutes inside an ad unit. It was unbelievable. What we did was, and, and I think we could have even made the obstacles more fun, but we put a quest. We said, let's find a guy who can go on a quest. The quest will be dramatic because your product features aren't dramatic, but he'll be showing how he did it. And he was even able to say things like, you know, I was really able to get no overlap on the spray. Otherwise it would have taken me more than an hour and I would have been screwed. So he worked everything the client wanted in, but it had drama to it, you know? So HGTV is great at that. If you ever watch their stupid programming, which I have to watch because for every hour of basketball I watch, my wife makes me watch an hour of HGTV. So that limits my basketball watching. But I, I have actually learned a lot of basic, simple plot stuff. You know, the couple always has different goals for the house, right? Um, there's always obstacles in the way. You know, it has to be a certain neighborhood, whatever it is. So anyways, um, that's that. Let's uh, keep going. Journey and return. For our purposes, this can really meld into the quest a little bit. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think either one is fine. I'll just take you through a couple examples that make this a little bit different. Um, the Wizard of Oz is a journey in return. She went somewhere, she went back. There's a lot of stuff in the way. Um, same with Where the Wild Things Are, which is, as opposed to Moby Dick, this is a great book. Um, but anyways, there's a, there's a fall, you know? Um, and then there's some sort of fascination like the yellow brick road and all the little people. And then there's a lot of obstacles. Now, one thing you're gonna notice, there are obstacles in every plot. So basically, there is no such thing as a story without obstacles. Just take that away. And that is the hardest thing to get your clients to think about. Um, there's always frustrations, there's always obstacles. That makes the story better. Um, in advertising, I think we could look at this plot as a journey to understanding, you know, a lot of brands want to teach their their customers something. They want to show them a different way to see the category, or to see the world, or even to see um, their own problems. So I think that if you think of it this way, you can get some good stuff. I, um, banks, for example, really want to um, take people on a financial journey that ends in some reward, and insurance companies to a degree. So I think you see this in some places. I'm going to show you what, what you probably never saw this because it didn't run on TV, but this is a really beautiful example of this. It, it takes about three, four minutes, but it's well worth it. Um, we have a very special relationship. Some people don't understand, but we do. Jill was a very good baby, just smiling, bubbling. She was just so cute. Oh, boy. You always have great expectations for your children. My expectations of what Joe's life was going to be included a husband. So when Nikki came to ask permission to marry our little girl, that startled me. I told her, this is not the dream I had for my daughter. I didn't say yes, I didn't say no. Coming out to the wedding from back east, I had 
some real apprehensions about it. What's this going to look like? Two girls getting married. You have to make a decision. Are you going to have a daughter that you are going to maintain a very wonderful relationship for the rest of your life? Or are you going to lose that child? This was a situation that I had to come to understand. Once we got out to California and we saw how happy they were, all that trepidation just seemed to go away. That, you know, that was a big, big turning point. Of course, walking Jill down the aisle, just looking at her, she was breathtaking, beautiful. Judy and I were just swelling with emotion. You come to terms with it and you say, this is the very natural order of things in your life, and it's supposed to be this way. Jill was born. There was a certain spark in her eye and a glow in her heart that quickly became very apparent to Judy and I. When she got a little older, and all of a sudden that spark that I looked for in your eyes and your heart, I didn't see it. And it pained us greatly. And all of a sudden, bang, there's Nick, and that spark is back. And we are just so happy that we have our Jill back, and now we have Nick. And we love you both. What's so great about that is, I mean, it would have just been a really soppy commercial. I mean, imagine forcing that into 30 seconds and you'd see him in the airport and Expedia, you know, he'd have his, you know, phone with Expedia's agenda on it. It would just be horrible. They just got out of the way and let this guy tell a story of travel as a means to deeper understanding. That is a beautiful thing because otherwise it's about, we can get you a cheaper price. Wow, we get, you know, it's just, this is such a wonderful way to position a company now. They, that's not all they do. A lot of their advertising doesn't, isn't able to do this. But in places, you know, so that's the other thing. It isn't all or nothing, you know. Um, clients have a lot of tools and a lot of media options, so there's a lot they can do. But I, I just love that campaign. I think it's great. And there's a whole series of them. They're really beautiful. So, um, so I love that. Um, you know, again, uh, banks take people on journeys. Um, you know, a journey to your first home. That's what HGTV is a lot. I don't see why a bank wouldn't sponsor HGTV, partner with them, and actually, we don't, we don't have a bank, but um, actually do, you know, that kind of stuff and get into the real stories and let the, let the client get out of the way a little bit and let these stories come through. So um, I think that's a good example of journey and, and return kind of, you know. Um, okay, let me, I got one more, and uh, I got a good case in here too. Um, rebirth, Sleeping Beauty is the classic, like Cinderella is for eggs to riches, Sleeping Beauty certainly is for rebirth. Uh, you know, she's practically dead there sleeping. And uh, isn't there some other woman who gets pricked with a needle or something? Like a sewing machine? Can't remember that one. You know? You know. W who's that one? No, the spinning wheel. Oh, yeah. Who, that's another one, right? That's another one of these things. It's a Wonderful Life is kind of a rebirth thing, you know? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Right, right. So, um... Yeah, Rapunzel, yeah. right, right. So, um, oh, and then there's the guy who slept forever. Um, I mean, there's just so many of these things, you know? It's, it's amazing. Rip, right, Rip Van Winkle, right. That's hard to say. Um, so, so anyways, uh, again, you'll notice some things are, are similar, but um, there's kind of, you know, a, a dark shadow. Things don't seem right. Um, you know, maybe we'll get lucky and this thing won't really happen, um, which is the status quo, but then the other shoe drops. It kind of you know, it does happen, and um, there's darkness. There's a state of mess for a while, and then the spell is broken. So um, this, is, this sometimes is a tougher one, I think, to find in our clients, you know? Um, so again, if you were dealing with corporate clients and they made a mistake, which they do, 
if you could get them to really not gloss over that mistake, but dwell on it a little bit, that's where the rebirth comes. The mistake is the dark spell, the darkness that has descended because we screwed up. People love self-deprecation and it really helps. It's tough to get clients to do it. So I, I think those are angles you can look at a rebirth story with, with clients sometimes. Um, I've been thinking about this Krylon paint a lot, even though I don't work on it, but I've been thinking about the idea that um, uh, there's a story in the objects that are restored by this. So that's rebirth, you know? You find your grandmother's thing, and that thing is all the paints chipped off, and it's, it's been in this state of despair. It's like Sleeping Beauty. It's been stuck there for years in an attic. You bring it back to life. Rebirth story. So put that one, put that one on the list. Oh, yeah, right. All right. I, I just thought of it. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Right. So um, this is kind of interesting. This is um, th this is an amazing story that Gatorade did. I don't know if you guys know about this. They got all these guys back together who played football against each other. I love this story. So um, it, it's as good as the Expedia one. So let me play this. And then I've got one more thing to show you and I'm done. I work 10 to 12 hours in my profession and, and you have to spend time with your family and kids after that and the first thing that goes is exercise. I love this story. It's about a score that hasn't been settled in 15 years on the football field. Welcome the 87th meeting between the State Lions of Phillipsburg and the Red Rovers of Easton. A 27 yard field goal attempt. It's blocked! The whistle has blown. This one is over! A sister kisser! Time might be worse than the loss. We think we have a score to settle. Gatorade has chosen to team up with the towns of Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and Easton. We're inviting the guys from the 93 team to strap on the helmet and shoulder pads and replay that game to determine the true champion once and for all. Finally tonight, old high school football rivals. With the same guys who played 16 right. years ago. This is one of the best moments. It will be the best moment in life other than when my daughter was born. Replay is a game the Gatorade's doing. He had to remember that. You're that. Athlete, you know. you're all Oops. The original head coaches were invited back. The original cheerleaders, some of the original band members are going to be there. The returning players underwent a rigorous two-month training regimen <laughs> created by Gatorade Sports Science Institute. I lost uh, 57 pounds for this process. Wow. Throughout the eight weeks, the documentary content was cut into episodes and posted online, allowing the nation to follow their journey. I said to Coach, I'm going to kind of come out and sweat and warm up. And he said, no, we go full pads every day. And I'm like, Coach, we're in our 30s. <laughs> come on. Come on. Fifteen hours away from the game, you're just not going to be able to get that kind of finesse in a day. Your eyes are certainly showing the concussion. A lot of people out there saying you can't do it. Let's prove them wrong. One, two, three. 10,000 tickets sold out in 90 minutes. Everybody was so down and so depressed. This is such a Gatorade athletes Peyton and Eli Mann joined as assistant coaches. The field temperature right now is at 100 degrees. In the most oppressive of conditions, there were no major injuries, no heat exhaustion, and no broken bones. Talk about the ultimate product demonstration. 160 million media impressions followed, including being named one of CNN's top stories of 2009 in a six-page feature in Men's Health. After calls from nearly every major studio, a feature film is currently in development. And Replay is now a documentary television series. The one-hour premiere aired nationally on Fox Sports Net to its 90 million subscribers in prime time on Sunday night, Thanksgiving weekend. Gatorade's lineup finder allows former athletes to reconnect with teammates online and nominate their original high school teams for upcoming seasons of the show. You can't do it! They said you can't do it! Stay here, look at your heart! They said to look inside of you! Look! It's an astronaut! And play the damn game! No matter how old you are, 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, you're always an athlete. So they found a story attached to it, really built it and worked it, turned it into episodes, had social around it. I, I just love this. I, I just think it's so brilliant. I mean, think about how far we've come from doing an ad with a message in it when you're doing this kind of work. So 
it, it's, it's pretty cool. I have one more rebirth um, from our Akron Children's series to share with you. Um, I love this. Th th this is interesting. Um, for some odd reason, we didn't win any awards for, for this new campaign. I don't, totally don't get that. Because we did something, I, I think everybody's a little sick of our Akron Children's. It's been around so long and a lot of people have copied it. But this year what we did was we actually gave kids cameras. Our, our mission at Akron Children's is basically kids rule. Everything at the hospital is based on kids. So for years we've been doing these commercials where you know, we feature kids. Then we said this year, let's just give the kids the cameras and get out of the way. So this is a cool spot, 100% shot by this girl. We did edit it and we wrote the art cards. But anyways, it's kind of a rebirth story. So take a look at this. It's a product demonstration, man. She couldn't walk or talk or dance and look at her now, you know. And um, it's funny, she, we gave these kids cameras and we let them have the cameras for about three or four weeks. We would check in with them, then we'd sort of look at things and say, what if you did more of this? You know, so one of the themes was this dancing thing. We're like, just, you know, dance around the world if that's what you like and film it. So she had it with her dad. I mean, we have an hour of this girl dancing her way through life. It's just, it's so beautiful. And again, it's letting her story do our work for us, you know. Um, so l let me just summarize. Um, th these are the basic, basic plot structures. Again, what I tell my people that I work with is, I, I don't really care if you mix and match and blend. You need obstacles. You need to figure out what the hero is. It's good to have an enemy. Those are the things that I think you take out of it in our business, you know. Um, I'd rather have one or two of those working than none, because typically none of those elements are in a lot of the work that we do as, a, as an industry. So, um, so that's where I go with that. Um, just as importantly as plots is actually the elements of story. And I'm gonna show you one last piece of work we did this year that I think is pretty interesting. Um, but basically, I, I think if you take out of it that you need conflict, you need character, you need suspense. Any way you can build that into the work you do, it's gonna be so much better. Whether it's following a plot or it's got classic elements, at least if it has some of this. So I'm gonna show you what was the worst assignment that came into the agency last year? The worst assignment, Gugon Oven Cleaner. Okay, Gugon's a cool product. I, I love Gugon, we, we've worked with them for years. Um, you know, that's the stuff that gets everything out of everything. But they came out with an oven cleaner. It is just the most average, uninspired product ever. It was like, hey, we stuck this in a bottle and now it's an oven cleaner. It really didn't you know, do anything that special, to be honest with you. And they wanna run a direct response TV spot because they're gonna get better, you know, play, use of, uh, you know, their media dollars will get them more spots. So it just sounded horrible because it, I don't, I'll do anything. I mean, a direct response TV spot would be great if there was something you could make dramatic and all that. But the problem is it's just an oven cleaner. It costs $4, you know, direct response is supposed to change your life. I mean, it's like, you know, give me a product that'll make juice out of cucumbers or something. But anyways, so we weren't quite able to create a story, but we did use a lot of storytelling things or suspense and drama and character in here. And it's just a really fun little little spot that made the best out of not the best assignment. So let me just show you this. Hey, did you be the one who put that the socks in? Wait, wait. I am so dirty, the oven mitt. Where's the, where's the rubber glove? When your oven gets this dirty, you need new Goo Gone foaming oven cleaner from the Goo Removal Experts. Goulash. It gets anything you baked on off. The super cleaning foam dissolves tough, burnt on food and grease in just minutes. Oh, German sausage jokes, they're the worst. Get it, the worst? So, a quiche, a uh, gingerbread man, and a lady finger all walk into another. So throw away those rubber gloves and forget about fumes. Gugon's got a fresh orange scent. Gugon, it's citrusy. Oh, I haven't felt this good since I was new. Are you checking out my rack? So silence that dirty oven. Go to gugon.com slash TV. So it's got all the typical crap in it that it has to have, but, take advantage of you know, a special TV offer. I wouldn't say it's really a story, but it's a nice interaction. The characters are, you know, there's a little bit of suspense and surprise. So anyways, um, so that's what I got. Now you don't have to read this book, possibly. <laughs>
Aaron, you're going to read this, right? You're the type that would. Okay. So. I would get it and start it. Any questions for Jim? How did you, uh, companies don't like to admit they make mistakes, but I, I go back to the dominoes. Oh, what a great campaign. I love that campaign. Everybody Brilliant. Kind of food it, but right. It worked like crazy, worked right? Like crazy. Yeah. Because they came out and were absolutely honest, saying, yep. we screwed up. Yeah. And we keep screwing up, but we know we screwed up. I actually, I actually brought that case. I built, you know, I took all the pieces and parts from Domino's, brought it in to talk to one of our Nestle clients um, and used it as an example. Boy, I got laughed out of the room. They were like, we would never do anything like that. Are you crazy? So some clients, you know, are gonna and some aren't. But, you know, I said, geez, look at these results, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, no, there's no answers. But that's great. And then they did a great job of finding all the stories. They went and tracked down people who had actually tweeted about them and, you know, surprised them. It was, it was, it was great. So it's an exciting time in our business if you think about it differently. What, what, what I like is it's just, you know, there's all these digital people around now and our agency's filling up with them. And, you know, they, they are so technology-oriented and tactic-driven that they forget that these stories can be melded and then you've got something beautiful. But if you leave the story out and you leave the idea out, you just got a bunch of fucking widgets. I mean, that's nothing, you know? So well, that's my point. I can't ask is, you know, we don't do a ton of advertising work but building apps and building websites. And so it's very clear how this relates to a spot or you know, copy or whatever. But what recommendation would you give to a team who is like, why well, build a website? Like, yeah. Why is this important to me? Right. G gaming. Gaming is absolutely all this stuff. Every video game in the world is overcoming the monster. So, you know, if you build gamification stuff into websites and into digital applications, you've really done it. You've absolutely brought um, plot in, into that in, in a lot of ways, you know. And, and social, that is about a quest, you know what I mean? Let's get everybody to tweet about the same social problem and our brand will sponsor it. That, that becomes a quest, you know. So I, I think there's so many things you can do. and um, I guess I brought a lot of examples, you know, in my defense, although I, I think you're right to point that out, that are just easier to get, you know what I mean? But I think you absolutely can bring in story to digital, um, social, to websites, to the construction of apps and everything else. It does take a, a, an effort. Because what's different, and the thing that was resonating with me, and I'm kind of disappointed with the two of my team that were supposed to come couldn't hear this, is I think especially with some of my younger teams, they're like, well, I get sometimes too focused the correct and right reasons of why they put a, a thing on a page mm -hmm. here. Yeah. This is what research tells me and this is best practice. But what they should be doing is looking at these, the stories behind it that relate back to whatever the client's goals and then creating this crafted story that has one of these you know, plot twists in it. Right. Not, well, it has to be this many pixels because this is the way it's supposed to be. Nobody cares about that. Right. What people care about is the fact that you told us your stated goal is X, this person on a quest, they're going to yeah. get to this quicker by doing right. this. Right. I agree. In digital, lately, or, or you know, for a while, I think it's getting a little better, the tail is wagging the dog, as far as I can tell. So this is my attempt to make sure that the dog is in front of the tail or, or whatever mm -hmm. would be the way to figure that out. But um, we're doing a digital app right now for, maybe you could even talk about it, for uh, letting people create stories about their gardens, right? Do you know about that? Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, I thought you worked on them. Okay, so um, for, for one of our clients, Troy built it, um, does a lot of gardening. We're actually building a storytelling app that is going to um, live on, I think it's Facebook and their website, maybe a microsite. I really, I'm not positive, but you plug in um, a couple of photos, you upload a couple of photos of your garden, maybe your plans that you drew out, the before and the after, and it makes a 35, 40 second movie that you can share with friends instantly. So that's all digital. It, there's a lot of software back there and a lot of programming, but we really focused on the story. We hired illustrators to actually draw clips so that if you say grass or lawn, it draws in an illustrated animated clip of grass or lawn. So you literally get a, a little fun movie. So again, there's so many things you can do, but it doesn't happen unless you put it out there to people. You know, I don't know what you, role you play, but um, you gotta tell people, look, I, want, I expect you to know all that stuff. I expect you to do the best practices and put the button in the right place, but that's not it. First, it starts with this, so think about that, yeah.
So. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, no, my pleasure. I wish wish there were more folks, but um, yeah, well, it was fun. Th thanks for having me.